Bismillah. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. This is, uh, although I, I have moved away, I still consider this my, yeah, one of my home masajid. So I have to say one of because this is live, so they'll hear me over there too. Alhamdulillah. So one of my life. Uh, Bismillah. So inshallah, this was intended to be um, its own introduction to maybe the weekend, but also kind of to stand alone um, for those. So if, if you're not going to attend this weekend, it, it won't take away. Um, inshallah, but hopefully just lay some of the foreground for this. So, um, Bismillah. So, actually taking a step back, I think it's important to think about what is the role of knowledge in Islam? Why, why study? What's the point of the masjid and everything that it puts on in terms of the various programs, right? Alhamdulillah, I was looking at the MCC email yesterday and I kept scrolling and scrolling, mashallah, right? Why is knowledge so central and pivotal? There's many reasons for this, but if you look at Imam al-Ghazali he, in his Ahya Ulum al-Din, which he used as the great summary of the religion and reviving the sciences of the religion, the first book in the Ahya and the revivification of the uh, Islamic disciplines is Kitab al-Ilm, right? That knowledge is central to preserving and understanding the religion properly. Right, that's what the prophets come and they bring is knowledge of revelation. A knowledge, revelation is by definition something beyond the ceiling of reason, something we can't figure out on our own, but that's knowledge. Knowledge of what happens when we die. Knowledge of what happens after we're resurrected, of the afterlife. What does God want from us, right? That's all knowledge and knowledge is how that is preserved. So, you know, it's, it's interesting because in the Quran, there's only, according to the Ramadan, there's only one time the Prophet Sallallahu is commanded to ask for something. And he's commanded to ask for knowledge. وَقُلْ رَبِّي زِدْنِي عِلْمًا O Allah, and say, O my Lord, increase me in knowledge. Right? So, this prayer that the Prophet Sallallahu was instructed to do is not for Iman, which is obviously beautiful, right? Faith, or Taqwa, piety, or prayer, or anything. He was commanded to ask for an increase in knowledge because knowledge is the means to all of those other goods out there and if you look you know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he created the angels and he created the jinn and then he created mankind what distinguished mankind if you look at that passage in Surah Al-Baqarah in the second chapter of the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he tells the angels right that that I'm going to establish a khalifa, a deputy on earth, right? And they say, why will you do that while the, you know, you're going to place someone in it who will shed blood and sow corruption in the earth while we glorify your praise, right? And what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? Inni a'lamu ma la ta'lamun. I know that which you don't know. So already it's about knowledge. Allah is saying, I know what you don't know. And then as the story continues, we're told that Allah brings Adam forth and he teaches him the name of all the names of all things, and the scholars differ in what that necessarily means. But he's given knowledge of something, and then he brings the angels forth, right? And he tells the the angels, name these things. What do they say? Subhanak la ilma lana illa ma alamtana. We don't have any knowledge unless you've taught us, right? And then he says, Oh Adam, tell him the name. Tell them the names of these things. Knowledge is what distinguishes Adam over the angels. It's knowledge, right? This is what the human being is, is unique in, is the ability to acquire knowledge, to preserve it, and to transmit it. That's what makes us unique amongst Allah's creation, right? And so knowledge is uh, central to our tradition. There's many hadiths, statements of the Prophet wasallam, in which he tells us about the centrality of knowledge, right? Many, many famous hadiths, but we'll just say a few just to remind us of why learning is so pivotal in, in, in the religion. No matter where you are in the path of knowledge, right, the Prophet ﷺ is encouraging us to continue this path, right? The Prophet ﷺ said that seeking knowledge, طَلَبُ الْعِلْمِ فَرِيدَةٌ عَلَى كُلِّ مُسْلِمٍ Right? Seeking knowledge is an obligation for every single Muslim. You can't say, okay, we have scholars and teachers and they learn, so I don't have to learn. That's not true. They learn some things, alhamdulillah, that we have them, right? 
because we can't learn everything. We're glad that we have doctors and engineers and lawyers. We can't all know everything about everything. But on some level, we should all seek to attain more knowledge of our own faith, of what God has revealed to us, about what the Prophet ﷺ has taught us, right? And then the Prophet ﷺ tells us that, that when somebody goes out to study, to seek knowledge, there's many different hadiths. The fish in the ocean, pray for him, right? The, the angels lower their wings, praying for that, that person, right? Why do, the angels, why do the angels pray for the person who's studying? It's a question to consider. By the way, one of the things that I, I, I will say, it's really important for us to think deeply about these things, to not just memorize them, but to ponder them. Why? They know that the purpose of creation, right? The purpose of creation, that we were only created mankind and jinn to worship Allah, that needs knowledge, to know Allah. Right? We have to know God. But the only way we can do that is through knowledge. Right? So it is fulfilling the purpose of the creation of the world. And the angels want us to succeed in that. The Prophet ﷺ said in a different hadith, right, that you should seek knowledge from the cradle to the grave. And another hadith, it's a bit weaker in its authenticity, but its meaning is sound, to seek knowledge even if you go into China, right? So seeking knowledge is central. It's central. Now, what does knowledge do for us? Does knowledge necessarily transform us, learning something? It doesn't. If we're honest, it doesn't. It should, but it doesn't, right? Now, if you think about a thief, Let's say a Muslim thief. They exist, right? Believe it or not. They shouldn't, but they do, right? Now, doesn't, even if you ask a Muslim child, has a law, you know, is your provision written for you? Even a younger child might already know that. They'll say, no, your provision is written for you. Does stealing increase your risk? It doesn't. So why does that, how, if a Muslim knows that, how can he go and steal? It's because that theoretical knowledge hasn't penetrated his heart. He knows that knowledge theoretically, but the truth of that is not, has not penetrated his heart. He doesn't have certainty of that knowledge, right? And so we're introduced to this concept that's central in our tradition of the varying levels of certainty, right? There are different levels of certainty that one can have. And the ulama talk about these three levels. There's ilm al-yaqeen, there's ayn al-yaqeen, and there's haq al-yaqeen, right? There's having certain knowledge of something. So for example, if we're sitting here and people were to run in and say, there's a, there's a fire outside. Would you have knowledge of the fire that's outside? It's not, it's, not a tough, it's not a trick question. Would you have knowledge that there's a fire outside? Yes. Yes, you would know. They all came and they told you there's a fire outside. Oh my God, there's all these fire trucks. And you see this commotion. Okay. Is that the same kind of knowledge as if you run out and you look and you can see the flames? It's a deeper level of knowledge, right? You, you went from ilm al yaqeen Right? Ta'in al yaqeen Is it the same as somebody who got burned by the fire? They have a deeper knowledge of the flame. That, yes, that was a real fire there. I felt the heat of it, or I got burned by it. Right? So there's levels of knowledge based on the level of certainty in the heart. So you can know something, and it remains theoretical. But it, there's a depth to it that's missing. And that's why the study of knowledge has to be uh, coupled with <coughs> pondering, reflection, worship, devotion, ibadah, prayer, dhikr, all of these things, so that it's not just all in the head. It's just theoretical. There's people, there's non-Muslims, they don't believe anything, but they have wonderful knowledge of tafsir and the Qur'an and things the Prophet ﷺ did. They have all, but it does them nothing. Right? They're like, I guess, like the internet. Like this thing knows, has a lot of information. That's not knowledge. And so, what is true knowledge is when that knowledge, the information becomes integrated and it becomes holistic. And you start to develop an understanding based on that knowledge. Right? You have an understanding based on that knowledge. I'll give you an example. There's people who um, can be told, and I'm one of them, such and such a food is unhealthy for you, you should eat less of it. You still kind of struggle with that, right? You know that. But then, then the brownie is in front of you, and you, kinda, you tend to forget that knowledge, right? Then there's people who, they spend time 
and they've had enough experience where they've eaten something and then they felt sick from it. So they stay away from it. Or somebody who studied what happens when you eat these things. So their knowledge increases, right? And you can see a correlation between their understanding of that and how it impacts their behavior, right? Like, Generally speaking, if somebody's a nutritionist, right, it's more likely by studying and really having a deep understanding of how harmful this is, the degree of harm, the love, the multiple layers of harm, it's easier for them to abstain from it, right? And so that correlation between having some knowledge that's theoretical and a depth that actually informs how we behave. You know, one of the... Um, sayings of the philosophers of the past is there's a difference between information and knowledge and then wisdom right and so we have to understand the difference the internet can sometimes give you information very important to understand it's not knowledge and it most definitely is not wisdom right if you've had the blessing of sitting with a person of wisdom you'll you also know the difference between that and knowledge right but there are you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَمَنْ أُوْتِيَ الْحِكْمَةَ فَقَدْ أُوْتِيَ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا And whoever has been given wisdom has been given much good. That wisdom is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And so when we study our deen, it has to be this integrated holistic thing. It can't just be this, like you're learning bits and pieces. Uh, I had a teacher who used a, a great metaphor in college talking about the holistic picture. And he said, it's, you know, there's people, they're putting together a couple of small puzzle pieces, but they don't know what the box top of the puzzle looks like. You know, that, that's the thing that has the whole picture there for you. You know what it is you're trying to put together, right? Many of us, we don't always know what a mu'min or a mu'mina really looks like. What, what does that mean, right? And so we're trying to put in these little things. We, we learn something about a sunnah of how to do this or a sunnah of how to do that. But it's really hard to put it all together. So it's important. That's what studying does. It helps us to see the bigger picture. It helps us to integrate these things. So for me, one of the exercises that I think is, is very useful is before we embark on any study of Islam is to put the entire religion in the context of the human story. Right? So what's the earliest chronological event recorded in, in the Qur'an? as far as we know. What's that? Okay, that's fair. <laughs> the creation of the universe. Okay, but I'm talking about for the human story, for our story. What's the earliest thing? Uh, right? So, before the creation of Adam, most people think that our story starts with, with who? With Adam and Eve, alayhi salam, right? But there's another event in the Qur'an, very important, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that He gathered the souls of the children of Adam, Bani Adam, from the loins of Adam. And He gathered them all before Him, and He made them testify against themselves. And Allah asked this question, so all of our souls, not our bodies, mind you, the souls were gathered in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and He asked one question, Alastu bi rabbikum? Am I not your Lord? Right? So it's very important to understand. You can't understand all of the prophets that come after without understanding this moment. Right? Am I not your Lord? And we said what? Bala. Indeed. Right? And then what does the rest of the verse say? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Lest you say on the day of judgment, we weren't aware. This removes the excuse that we have on a spiritual level, our souls are imprinted, with this knowledge that we have a Lord. Even the atheist, deep down, has this knowledge. There's a knowledge, it's in the heart, it's in the soul, it's a fitrah. Right? And so, that's why the word kafir, it's the word for disbeliever in the Qur'an, it's one of its meanings, literally in Arabic, is the farmer that covers a seed. He's covering something up. Because there is this innate knowledge, right? That we know that we are created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the ayom alas, the day of what's called the Grand Covenant, is one way of phrasing it in English, is when we made a covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in which we acknowledge that He's our Lord. Right? Do, do any of us remember this on a conscious level? Right? So then we're born in the world. 
And what happens? We have to now make good on that covenant. That's what this whole life is about, right? Now our souls know something. We made a promise. So Allah is now putting that soul into a body and living a life in the dunya. And we have to go and live this life now. And we have to affirm that. That's why what was every prophet sent with? La ilaha illallah. There's only one God. That's the, am I not your Lord? That's confirming that. That confirms that covenant. Right? In fact, there's a couple of, there's two hadiths that when you combine them, I think there's a beautiful meaning that comes out. The Prophet ﷺ is reported to have said in, in a hadith that every king, this is a metaphor by the way, a lot of language about God has to be metaphorical because he's beyond comprehension. But the Prophet ﷺ said, every king has a right hand on earth. Right? Do you guys know what the right hand of the king means? No, typically the, the king, huh? No, it's the ring. The Yameen, the king used to wear a ring. And what did you have to do in order to pay your respects to the king? You kiss the ring. What does that mean when you kiss the ring? You're acknowledging that king's authority over you, right? So the Prophet ﷺ said, every king has a right hand to be, right? And the Yameen of Allah on earth is the black stone. Right? That's why, why do we go to kiss the black stone? It's a symbolic thing. What does it mean when we kiss? See, that's the thing. We, we're doing these things, right? People are lining up to kiss the black stone, knowing that it's a sunnah, and that's beautiful. But there's a depth to it there. What do you say when you're going to hajj or umrah? Labayk Allahumma labayk. What's, what's labayk mean? You're answering the call. You're going back, saying, in the dunya, I'm going to... The, what, that covenant I made before my soul was infused, right? I am going, coming to declare that again, right? And there's another hadith, it's a bit weaker, but its meaning is, is sound, where our mother Aisha radiallahu anha said, she said the Prophet sallam, is reported to have said that the covenant was poured into the black stone. The covenant, the alastu bi rabbikum, that covenant we made was poured into the black stone. And so then we come and we, con we, we come to the house of Allah and we declare, لَبَيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ لَبَيْكَ We're at your service, my Lord, at your service. لَبَيْكَ لَا شَرِيكَ لَكَ لَبَيْكَ You have no partner. I'm coming to answer your call. إِنَّ الْحَمْدَ وَالنَّعْمَةَ لَكَ وَالْمُلْكَ Right? Praise and all bounty and goodness is from you and you have dominion over us. Right? That's the mulk. You're declaring that Allah is the king. And you, we are his servants, right? So when you understand that, now you can understand then we're created. Prophets are sent. There's guidance. La ilaha illallah. Why is everybody called to Tawheed? Because that's imprinted in our DNA. That's printed on our souls, right? La ilaha illallah. So that is the background for the human story. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, He sent a prophet to every people to warn them, and to tell them to worship Allah. Now they all varied in the sharia, in the, excuse me, in the legal code that they were sent with. That varied between prophets, right? We know that. But what was the same? The belief in la ilaha illallah, the belief of prophets, risala, and the day of judgment. You're going to be resurrected and you're going to be held accountable. There's an afterlife, right? And if you look Many of the world religions all have this. These are universal because Allah sent prophets to all people. So we believe that there, were, there are remnants of nubuwa, of prophethood, in many places. Right? We can't confirm which aspects are and aren't, but we know that there was guidance sent to all people. Right? So the Prophet ﷺ, he comes with the final message. The Prophet ﷺ said in a very beautiful hadith, where he said that the similitude of me to the other prophets, the parable of me and the other prophets, is like a man who builds a beautiful home, right? And people are going around in awe of the beauty of the structure, right? And they say, wow, what a beautiful structure, except it's missing a brick. And the Prophet ﷺ said, I am that brick. 
Okay? You guys understand the metaphor. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through the succession of prophets, is sending the, a message to humanity. I, 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 sometimes I think as Muslims, it's hard to understand how profound that hadith is because we don't know how other religions view the rest of the world. For some religions, the whole world is in darkness and only, that, only one religion had any light in it. All religions are false and our religion is the only truth. Right? For Muslims, it's a very different thing. It's that all of this history contributes to this building of the house of Islam and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he doesn't demolish it, he doesn't he could have said, the prophets came, but they built a corrupt thing, and I demolish it, and I'm building a new and better house. Right? But that's not what the Prophet ﷺ said. That's not how he viewed his message. He came to confirm, and clarify, and rectify, and preserve the previous messages. The Qur'an is replete with stories of previous prophets. Right? So... They are all necessary precursors to the Muhammadan legacy, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But he completes and perfects that home, okay. And so this final version of the religion, this most complete version, supersedes and com and includes the previous religions. What do I mean by supersedes? Allah subhanahu wa taala tells us that the Quran, right, was sent as a muhaymin over the previous messages. That it is the arbiter between the different religions. Because we're told, previous messages were altered. How do you know what's altered and what's authentic? The Qur'an comes to clarify that, right? And so we have the most perfect and complete and preserved version of Allah's message to all of humanity. Now that's one thing that distinguishes the message of Islam. What's another thing? Every prophet was sent to his, to his people. But the Prophet ﷺ was sent to all mankind. Right? This is, this is the uh, very important aspect. Because now when you understand it, the need for all of humanity to have Islam and to be rescued by Islam and saved and enriched by Islam becomes clear. Right? Now, at the same time, this is where it gets interesting. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that the whole world will never become one ummah. Not everybody will believe. People will have other beliefs. That's part of his wisdom. There's a variety in the world. Not everybody will see the truth as clearly as others. Right? And so, it's part of a divine wisdom. And then he says, فَاسْتَبِقُ الْخَيْرَاتِ So vi, race against one another to do good deeds. Just outdo each other in good and in virtue. Right? So other religions are always going to exist. We should compete with one another towards goodness rather than make it a point of contention. Human beings are just like that. So this most perfect and complete religion, just to really bring it home, is brought with the Prophet ﷺ. And then his framing and explanation of the religion is most perfectly summed up in one hadith according to the ulama. It's a very well-known hadith, but it's important to review it as, as it provides a nice conceptual framework. And this is the hadith that's called the hadith of Jibreel, alayhi salam. Okay. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the hadith is, is uh, narrated by Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, and it's rigorously authenticated. He said, we were sitting with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam one day, just by show of hands, how many of you are familiar with hadith Jibreel? Right, okay. Hadith Jibreel narrates, it's called Hadith Jibreel because a man comes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I'm going to give some spoilers, and he asks him a series of questions, right? And this man was mysterious, and he's not from Medina. And at the end of it, this questioner leaves, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam turns to his companions and he says, do you know who this questioner was? And they said, no, Allah and his messenger know best. And he said, that was Jibreel. And this is the operative phrase of the whole hadith. He came to teach you your religion. So that's how we know that the contents of that conversation are the perfect summation of the religion. He came to teach you your religion. So now that we know that, right, let's go back to the beginning and look at this hadith. In order, again, to know the big picture of Islam 
as we learn bits and pieces, we know how to fit them in, inshaAllah, right? So the first question is that Sayyidina Jibreel asks the Prophet Sallallahu again, he's a mysterious figure, nobody knows he's Jibreel at this point. He tells him, Ya Muhammad, akhbirni anil Islam. Tell me about Islam. And the Prophet Sallallahu answers with what? The five pillars, right? It's so what we all know as the five pillars. Here's what's interesting. If you ask most Muslims to, to give a summary of Islam, what do they do? Typically, we give the five pillars and we, we stop there, right? There's truth to that, but it's not perhaps the whole picture. So he gives the five pillars to testify the testimony, the shahada, to testify that there is nothing worthy of worship except Allah and that the Prophet Muhammad is his last and final messenger. To establish the prayer, to fast Ramadan, to pay the zakat, the purifying alms to the poor, and to make pilgrimage to Mecca, right? Alhamdulillah. Most even, most Muslims are familiar with these, right? And then he says, right, you have spoken rightly. And then the Sahaba say, we were surprised that he asks him a question and then says, you have spoken rightly. I'm going to ask you guys, who, who asks a question and then says, you have spoken rightly? A teacher. Perfect, right? Think about it. They ask a question, they know the answer, and then when you answer correctly, they tell you, yeah, you answered right. Right? So you can tell Sayyidina Jibreel is coming as a teacher right now. And then he asks a second question. He says, O oh Muhammad, وسلم, tell me about Iman. And here the Prophet وسلم, he lists the six objects of faith. Right? These are the six, and we'll talk about this inshallah. Though this weekend we're going to go into each of these things in depth, inshallah. He tells me you have to believe in Allah, you have to believe in God, His angels the scriptures, the prophets. I know it's easier in Arabic, right? Uh, the day of judgment and divine decree. Both the good and the evil thereof. These are the six things every Muslim must believe, right? And then he says, you've spoken rightly. Then he says, tell me about Ihsan. So this is the thing. You don't really hear Muslims say, give me a summary of religion. They don't say, oh, there's Islam, Iman, and Ihsan. They say, oh, there's the five pillars, right? Then we have the six objects of faith. And he says, tell me about Ihsan. The Prophet وسلم, very interestingly, he doesn't tell us what Ihsan is. He tells us the result of Ihsan. He says, Al-Ihsan, an ta'abudu Allaha ka'annaka tarah, wa illam ta'kun tarahu fa'innahu yaraq. It's to worship Allah as if you see Him. And if you cannot see Him, you know that He sees you. Right? It doesn't tell you how to attain that. It tells you that's what it is when you have it. Okay, and then he asks him a fourth question. He said, tell me, when is the hour? He, he asks him, tell me, when is the hour? And the Prophet wasallam says, the one being asked doesn't know more than the one asking. All right. And the ulama have an interesting thing where they, he doesn't say he doesn't know. He just says that they have equal knowledge about it, whatever that means. Allahu a'lam. So then, Jabil asks, tell me about its signs. What are the signs of the Day of Judgment? Right? So this is an important thing that we know, not only that the Day of Judgment is coming, but that there are signs of the Day of Judgment. Why is this important? So we learned about Islam, and we learned about Iman, and we learned about Ihsan, and now Sayyidina Jibreel is pointing out there's this other aspect that isn't of our religion that we study, but it's as the, our religious life as it will be lived. The way that we experience it as a community. Right? And so the Prophet ﷺ tells of some of the signs that you will see uh, the uh, naked and barefoot destitute herdsmen competing and building lofty buildings. And you will see, right, which I think we can all, have, we've seen, we've, that, that one, you, we can all check it off, mashallah, right? And then you will see the mistress giving birth to her, to her master, right? And that's a very, there's a lot that can be said about that. Right, but there's uh, we'll, we'll get into that, and that's when that's the last question. These four questions: Who was that? That was Jibril. He came to teach you your religion. Okay. So now, if you examine each of these, right, these are ways of assessing whether or not your Islam is balanced. Jib the Hadith of Jibril helps you to understand whether or not 
you are balanced in your deen. The first three are taklifi. They have a duty incumbent upon us. The last one, the signs of the end of time, they, we don't, there's no responsibility upon us. And I'm going to get to why that is so essential that Jibreel asked about it. Right? But the first three, Islam, right? What was Islam again? The five pillars. If you look at the five pillars, what are the five pillars? They're actions. Beautiful, right? And so with actions, these are things that we do with our body, that we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the medium of the body. And then Iman. What is Iman? These are beliefs. Where do beliefs reside? Right? In the mind, in the heart, both, right? There's a connection between them, right? But let's just say the mind for, for simplicity, right? And so there's a way in which we get our minds in conformity with reality, right? To have our mind, that's truth. When you know the truth, your belief is in conformity with reality. If somebody doesn't believe in the judgment day, right? That doesn't change the reality of the judgment day. It just means that they have a misconception about the reality of the world, right? And then the last is Ihsan, that you worship Allah as if you see Him, and if you cannot, you know that He sees you. Where, what, what is that? That's a state of the heart, of the soul, right? So you can see you have mind, you have body, and you have soul, right? If our deen is excluding any one of these three components, these three dimensions of the religion, right? Then it's lacking or it's imbalanced. If you are devout in your outward conformity to the rules and, 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 and the moral code of the religion, and you believe the tenets of Islam, but you're lacking that spiritual component, it's a dry, empty shell. Right? It's a dry, empty shell. You're not worshipping Allah with the sincerity, the sincerity that opens your heart to being aware of His watching you. Or worshipping Him as if you see Him. Right? So you're not getting, there's something else you're worshipping. Sometimes it's your, your own ego that you, you feel good, that you're devout. Right? But if Allah is not at the center of your worship, then you're missing something, right? Let's, this is the exercise that I want to do, the Venn diagram, right? So that's if you're neglecting Ihsan. Let's say you neglect Islam for a moment. What does that look like? So you have Iman and you have Ihsan. But you don't have Islam. What does that look like? You believe, right? You're attempting to be spiritually purified and attuned with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but you're not conforming outward. That's the I'm spiritual, not religious crowd, right? Oh, I believe and I have this relationship with Allah. Okay, do you try to obey Him? No, that's the, I'm, I'm not into that. Right? That's not the deen. That's the imbalance. There is no nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by disobeying Him. Right? So the sharia, the outward rules, are the road to that inward purification. Right? You cannot get to the point that you worship Allah as if you see Him, and if not, then you're aware He sees you without conformity to the, to, to the outward. Right? And now the last, if you don't have Iman, and you have the rituals, and you have the spirituality, but you don't have the faith, then it's like, it's these people who becomes a cultural tradition that you've just inherited, but you don't really believe that this is all real. There's people that are like, they're cultural Muslims. Right? They like to do certain things, and they partake in these things, but is it real? Right? Now, one of the things about the Sahaba, Sayyidina Ali said, if the veils were lifted and I could see the unseen, it wouldn't increase my faith at all. Now, that, that's a special state to be in. Right? But the point is, that's, that's a goal. That's a place to be. There are people, they reach that. Right? Now, if we want to be balanced believers, we have to work on all three of these simultaneously. Now, the, even Iman, by the way, is not something that you say, okay, I believe in these six things. There's a depth to Iman. Remember we talked about ilm al-yaqeen, ayn al-yaqeen, haq al-yaqeen, the fire out there, right? There's people that they know there's Allah, like somebody saying there's a fire out there. And then there's people they know uh, that Allah is, is there, the way seeing the fire. And then there's people, it's like they're burned in the fire. They're extinguished in love of Allah. That's real, right? There's depths of, you know, some of the Sahaba, and these aren't stories, right? This, this, this is historical fact. Some of them, they, one of them had a, an arrow in his leg that was stuck from a battle. 
And he said, just wait until I'm in the prayer. And when I'm in the prayer, you can pull it out. They're in such a state of presence with their Lord, they don't feel it when, 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 it, when it's pulled out. You know, you see these people go into meditative states where they can walk on hot coals and they, you know, all of these things, right? You're supposed to be like that with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you can be. That there is that connectedness. So when we study our Islam and when we learn our Islam, it has to be the, this prophetic model, right? Of the inward, the outward, and then the depth of, 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 of faith, right? There, there's, there's all three dimensions. Now, that fourth dimension, I said I was going to come back to it, tells you just like human life has, right? You're young, you got energy, right? You reach a peak and then you start to, right? That's the same of, of, of the human story. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi is telling us that at the end of the human story, things will become different. And we have to be able to recognize these signs. And there are pages and pages of hadiths with signs of the end of time. That if you read them, not only will you, I mean, you will be shocked at the accuracy. I mean, I, I'll share one. Because these things to me, they increase your iman. They help you prepare for the latter days, but they increase your iman. The Prophet ﷺ said, a man will leave, there will come a time, a man will leave his house and his thigh will tell him what his family is doing at home. What does that I mean? Like for us now, you're like, yeah, the, the early generations, they believed it. They just knew it. They didn't know what it meant, but they knew it, right? There's so many things now you read it like, subhanAllah, that's happened. We're here. Now, why did the Prophet ﷺ, what's one of the reasons why he told us about these signs and he warned us about these things? Because at the time when they're all coming is a time of great confusion. It's great confusion and it's darkness, and people will start to lose their faith from the tribulations that are coming, right? And so the Prophet ﷺ is telling us, when you see these things, you'll recognize them, it will make you firm, right? It will remind you that you're on the right path at a time when everybody's getting confused and distracted, right? So we work on balancing these three dimensions while knowing that we're going forward in time, and the Prophet ﷺ warned us that be patient, because there's no time that comes except that it's worse than the time before it. So things are, have this downward decline. And we have to work, this is our charge as Muslims, we have to work to make them better, to increase the light. But we also know at the same time that overall, with exceptions here and there, it's going downhill, right? And so, this is the prophetic legacy that we learn and we study our deen in order to understand how these three dimensions interplay and they're balanced, right? So, for example, when we get up to pray, we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to resurrect us on the day of judgment and hold it. What's the first thing we're accountable for is the prayer, right? So, we stand and we have faith. We know that Allah is our creator and He commanded us to do these things and he will resurrect us and hold us accountable right and then we say did I make proper wudu am I facing the qibla am I covered appropriately that's the Islam right and then what's the state of my heart when I'm in the prayer what's the state of my heart do I say Allahu Akbar and then I'm thinking about oh man I didn't pick up the dry cleaning and uh, right it happens to me I don't know if it happens to you guys right but your mind, shaitan, starts pulling on things, things you forgot all day, mashallah, they all come to your, to your mind and, and once you enter the prayer. Where's your heart? Where's your heart? And here's the greatest test for, for us that we should work on. What do you feel in the sujood? Where's your heart in sujood? Because when you're prostrating, that's a special moment with you and your Lord. Where are you? If it feels the same to you as when you're standing or when you're in line at the grocery store, something's wrong. You're just, you're just a robot, right? We can get AI to get a robot to do all of those outward actions. But the human soul has to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'll tell you something. If you're present with your Lord for a moment in the prayer, actually I'll say it differently. You can never be present with your Lord for only a moment in the prayer. The moment you're present with Allah in the prayer, You'll, you'll feel that pull. You'll feel that pull. It's there for you to take it if you're present. 
And it's not to say that shaitan doesn't continue to pull at you. There's a specific demon that's assigned to distract people in the prayer. And the Prophet ﷺ told us that a person will start the prayer and shaitan will steal a little bit from it and it'll be nine tenths of a prayer. And someone else he'll steal more and he'll have eight tenths of a prayer. Seven tenths, all the way down to one tenth of the prayer because somebody's distracted, right? The Prophet ﷺ told us that a man, he was in the prayer and he was fidgeting a lot, whatever he was doing, right? And the Prophet ﷺ said if his heart was still, his limbs would be still. So we see this relationship of the outward and the inward, right? So if you're struggling with presence in the prayer, you have to know that that is part of the prayer. That is the point of the prayer. You do all of the other aspects to enter, to prepare for entering into the Divine Presence. You know, previous ummas, they couldn't worship Allah outside of a, a sacred temple space that was designated. They had to enter into the Divine Presence literally. They couldn't worship Allah. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said, the whole earth has been made a masjid. We take that for granted as Muslims. We know we can pray anywhere. Right? That's clean. I mean, there, there are exceptions. But the earth is our temple by their language. They used to have to know, you have to go to the, imagine wanting to worship Allah and having to get on a horse or donkey or something and go out to the temple and, right? Go through all these rites and rituals just to enter to talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And we are given one of the, the blessings of being the Ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We have that here and now, everywhere. You can be in the grocery store, you can be in the mall, you can be at schools, right? But you're entering into that space. And so you have to be present in the heart. So, again, these aspects are three dimensions of the same object. You can't separate, because we're 3D, you can't separate us in that way. The deen also cannot be separated in that way. Each, there's interplay between all of them. So as we study in the religion and we want to grow in the religion, we have to keep that in mind. Now, because we're going to spend this weekend, inshallah, learning some other aspects of knowledge, it's important to understand how do we come to the conclusion that Islam says X? Right? What does Islam say about You get that question. What does Islam say about this? How do we know that and how do we arrive at that? There's different types of knowledge. The highest is wahi, revelation. And the highest wahi is the Qur'an, right? So the Qur'an is our primary way of knowing and understanding the universe as it is, right? Sometimes you think of the Qur'an as, oh, that tells us how to do salah or fasting or we get ahkam from it, we get rulings. No, 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 no. The Qur'an is first and foremost, right? Allah the creator of the universe, telling us about reality itself. So we have to develop a way of seeing the world, inshallah we get that with repetitive recitation of the Qur'an, that matches the Qur'an's world view, the Qur'anic world view. How does the Qur'an frame this? And that's something, and it comes from, there's a great Malaysian philosopher, uh, who I think just celebrated his 95th birthday. Uh, or 90th, one of them, but an incredible philosopher. He wrote a book on this, uh, and one of the things he, he said that was a, a great paradigm shift, he said, any concept that you want to weigh, you have to take it back to the Qur'an. And you have to find the Qur'anic term and framework to understand anything. Because that is the book revealed by the creator of the human, of humankind, of the world. There's nothing new that isn't going to be in there. You know, Sayyidina Umar said, if I lost my camel, I could find it in the Qur'an, right? <clears throat> Think about that for a moment. What did he mean by that? Meaning, you, there's nothing you can't find in the Qur'an, right? It was a way of saying, because in the Qur'an will be knowledge of asking the people of knowledge. It was in the Qur'an, right? Seeking help with patience and prayer, right? All of these things. So... You think we're going to run into any challenge as, as humankind and there's not going to be an answer in the Qur'an? Right? So any, any question we have about humanity, and I'll, I'll be direct, whether it's politics or whether it's race, whether it's economics, whether, whatever ism of the world, we have to find Qur'anic language. How does the Qur'an frame this? Right? And when you do that, that exercise puts wahi 
at the top and everything underneath. The second is the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, which is also a type of wahi. Because, وَمَا يَنْطِقُوا عَنَ الْهَوَى إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَى The Prophet ﷺ, he doesn't speak from his own desires or whims. It's wahi. Everything he says was wahi. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A different level of wahi. So then we have the sunnah, the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ, his statements, his behavior, his acts, all of these things. That's how we know. Then we know that there are people who inherited and studied this religion. And when they all agree on something, right, then we're told by the Prophet ﷺ that my community will never be in unanimous agreement on a misguidance. So then we have, when we hear all of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ agreed to X or they did X, that has its weight. And then we have aql, we have reason, right? The Prophet ﷺ said in another hadith, right? Al-hikmatu dalatul mu'min That wisdom is the lost property of the believer. Wherever he finds it, he has the most right to it. Right? So we can take wisdom from other faith traditions. <coughs> Excuse me. Right? So these are, and there are many levels to this kind of knowledge. Right? Even in the Qur'an, there are outward meanings. There are inward meanings. There's indications. There's, right? A verse doesn't just mean what the translation says. There's much more to it. So it's very important when we look at the tradition that our teachers have given us, that the scholars of Islam have handed down, that we appreciate it for its complexity. So one of the things that we say sometimes, if, if we're very honest, is we tend to say Islam is simple. Let me ask that as a question. Is Islam simple? Nobody has an answer. Tongue tied. What would you say? Is Islam simple? Somebody asks you. Yes? Yes? Okay. That's a fair answer, right? Anybody say no? Yeah? Okay. The answer is yes and no, because there's different... On one level, on one level, th the truths of Islam are simple and clear, such that, such, a, such that the most simple person can understand it. Right? There's a simplicity and a purity that every person can understand. Right? But there's a depth and complexity that can engage the greatest minds of human history for their, their entire lives, and they still haven't plumbed its depths. So it's both. You have to, there's, this is the thing. Sometimes we, you know, we have to have bifocals when you're looking at this stuff. Sometimes we tend to see things all in, in, in one way. So this is important for us to understand, right? And then, even when we look at knowledge... Right? We have to understand that things that reach us, the scholars are the ones that put it all together. They process the bigger picture. So for example, sometimes someone reads a hadith and they think it means one thing. But they don't know when was that said, what was the context, what other things were said about the same subject. Right? So again, the scholars put it all together to give us this integrated whole of the religion. All right? And so, one of the things about the study of Islam is that we have to understand people have different capacities. Right? Islam is like a great ocean. Some people, they like to dip their toes in. Some people go up to their ankles. Some people are pearl divers. They go all the way down. Right? It's there. There's something about the ocean that is simple. Its beauty is simple. Right? There's a great poem. Is that by Robert Frost, I think? About how people look out at the ocean and what's behind them is far more interesting and complex. And there's just, it's just a line with like, but people love to stare out at the ocean. They can stare out all day because of its simplicity. But there's a great secret in looking out at the ocean and seeing a horizon and the beauty there, right? So that simplicity also has depths. Now, going back to the study of Islam, right? I think it's important that we understand that we have a prioritization of knowledge. Not all knowledge is equally important to us or equally our responsibility. So, the scholars have divided Islam, the study of Islam, into what's called fardain, the individual obligations that every single one of us has to learn. 
It's our responsibility. You have to know how to perform the duties that Allah has made a duty on every Muslim. And then there are things that not everybody has to know, but at least some of us have to know. Right? And those are communal obligations. Right? So this is an important aspect for us to understand. Is that not all knowledge is necessarily for us. We may not be specialists. Right? But we should concern ourselves with those things that are our duties. Right? And here's the other beautiful aspect, actually. The basics of Islam, what we call the basics, have such an incredible depth that you find the greatest scholars of Islam always going, the, 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 because of that simplicity, still has a depth to it, they can spend their entire lives on that. Right? Sometimes we, we ask, we, you know, we get into this thing where we ask somebody to tell us something we haven't heard before. They say, oh, you know, I was at a talk. And yeah, you know, the speaker said, you know, my kids will sometimes say that. It's like, oh yeah, I, I already knew that. I've already heard that before, right? There's a depth sometimes that we're missing. You should be moved. There's, there's a person that I know who every time he says a dua, right? If you see him make the a dua, he says it every time like it's his first and last time saying it. The presence, right? The emphasis. Somebody will, like, I've seen people get in a line to make a dua for me, right? I'm thinking by the 10th time, he's going to be like, may Allah bless you, increase you, Ya Allah, who's next, right? He's present as if that's it. Why? Because he's present with his Lord. He's not present with the people. He doesn't care about the people, right? He's present with his Lord. And so every moment, He's present. You know, one of the scholars said, uh, uh, this is, this is going to be a little hard to wrap your head around, but this is a very uh, uh, important point. One of the scholars said that hell is a higher place than the dunya. It's a better place to be than the dunya. Everyone's like, what? Because in hell, you can never be in, in heedlessness of Allah. The people in hell are completely present with their Lord. So it has a higher station than the dunya. Because that's what we were created for. At least there, they're present with their Lord. Right? Now, what do we take from that? I can understand how that's, oh my goodness, that's, that's hell, right? The purpose of our life here is that presence with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we should get it in the dunya before it comes in the akhirah in a way that we can't handle, right? And the worst of all punishments of hellfire is distance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the greatest of all bounties of paradise is nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So it's all in the heart. It's all in presence with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? But you can't get there without this balance. Nobody can get there without the outward, without the faith, and without the inward dimension. Right? And so inshallah, I'm going to open it up to questions here shortly. That's what we're, we're going to try to study and cover, is taking these basics that I would encourage you, right, even if you know, to review them and to try to look at them in a way that's deeper than the time that you, the last time you might have reviewed it. It's like that thief we talked about, right? He knows his rizq is written, but he still steals. Because he only knows it here and it hasn't penetrated here. Right? But the beauty of this knowledge, you know, like the recitation of the Qur'an I was once with one of my teachers and he was seeing, you know, like there was a rain spout that was dripping water like over and over and the, there was a, a stone uh, slab underneath that you could see the hole from the, from the water drops on there daily, and he told me, it's a daily recitation of the Qur'an is like that to the heart you just have to keep at it and the depth, it, it will have its impact Initially, the recitation is on the tongue. But if you're consistent with the practice and you're present, it will begin to penetrate the heart. Right? So this is the beauty of our deen. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing. The, the Prophet ﷺ said that the, the, the apple of his eye of all of the dunya was what? The prayer. Right? He said... Of all the dunya, the thing that, that is, is, is brought, you know, the, the light of my eye is in the prayer, right? So the most beginner Muslim still has to pray. And the Prophet ﷺ says it's the greatest joy of the dunya. And some of the scholars, they used to say that if 
uh, if the kings knew what we experienced in the prayer, they would raise armies to try to take it from us. It's the greatest joy of the dunya, presence with your Lord in the prayer. But it takes work to get there. You know, some of the ulama even talk about, you know, they get into, if somebody prays extra prayers because it's the, 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 the sweetness of conversing with their Lord, do they get reward for it or are they doing it for the sweetness? I call that a good problem to have, right? If your prayer is so sweet that, right? But that's the point is that it should become at that point. But we don't do the prayer for that. That's, that's the thing. Allah gives spiritual states, but our duty is, is to show up and do what is our duty and put our effort. And then the gifts come from Allah. He gives them or He withholds them. Right? So, subhanak Allahumma bihamdik nashadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilaik. We can open up for some questions now, um, inshallah, and then I think we'll run. Yeah, please go ahead. Oh, there's a mic to pass around, sorry. Uh, thank you very much for um, the beautiful talk, and thank you for writing the book and, and coming and speaking with us tonight. Alhamdulillah. And so in, in, when you talk about the purpose of why Allah created us and what us to do in this world, numerous things like pillars, um, worshipping Allah, being, pre being present, getting near knowledge mm -hmm. um, even the prophets in the day of the judgment you, you mention um, what you're doing here tonight which is very commendable which is the propagation of the uh, religion promotion of the religion mm -hmm. perpetuation expansion and penetration within the societies that we live in, mm -hmm. was that because it's not commanded by Allah to do those things? Or by doing the other things which are more for yourself, mm -hmm. that if you do those things, it'll automatically result in perpet perpetuation and promotion and propagation yeah. of the mm -hmm. religion? Uh, it's a good question. Um, again, the Hadith of Jibreel lays out the foundational framework of how we view the religion, right? So, uh, the Prophet ﷺ laid out those three dimensions. That doesn't mean that anything not listed there is not an obligation or not a duty or not important in the religion. But this is the framework in which we understand everything else. Now, you bring up a great point. A different way to look at it is, one, you need knowledge before you can do what you are saying is important to do, right? So before you can call others or invite others or propagate, you have to have your own study first. So that's why we begin with the book of knowledge, right? We begin with the study. You cannot give something that you don't have yourself. But to support your point, those who call and teach and share the message of the prophets. They're doing the work of the prophets. That is their legacy. So the prophet وسلم, when he passed away, some of the companions were still in the marketplace afterwards. And Sayyidina Abu Huraira عنه, he comes to the marketplace and he says, the inheritance of the Prophet وسلم, is being divided in the masjid now. They're dividing out his inheritance. So some people went to go look and they saw that there were gatherings of knowledge, people studying. And he said, this is his inheritance. Right, the, the, the prophets don't leave gold and silver to be inherited, they leave knowledge. So no, you're, you're absolutely right, that is an important duty. Um, and we do have a duty, the Prophet ﷺ commanded us to convey this message on his behalf, even if it's just one verse. But before we can share, we have to have a proper understanding ourselves. Because then we know what to share, we know how to prioritize it, we know how to put it in. So it's, it's, uh, it's interesting, a lot of people misunderstand that commandment to share the convey it on my behalf even if an ayah and they think I only have to know an ayah to share it 
you should have a, 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 a good understanding of the religion as well. Wallahu alam. Yeah. So this is, uh, I'm, I'm going to confess here, I'm going to get in trouble for this. But one of my teachers and mentors is here, and it's making it challenging for me. And he's, he's a local gem, so you guys know him, but for me, I, I'm, I'm uh, it's, it's, it's a challenge. Did you have anything to add to that, uh, in terms of that? Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, so it's, it's making me, if I've started sweating in the last 30 minutes, you guys know why. Any other questions? Yeah. We can, pro yeah, let's, I'll take a question from the sisters if you guys don't mind. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullah. Were, were humans created to worship Allah? It, like we were created, I've been told many times that mm -hmm. we were created yes. to worship Allah. Yes. So there's a verse in the Quran in which Allah says that I only created mankind and the jinns in order to worship me. One of the meanings of that worship me is to come to know me through worship, right? The worship is there, but it's also a means to know Allah, right? To, to have this intimate relationship with Allah. Uh, and so he created us for our own sakes, right? Allah is not increased. We could all worship Allah day and night, and it would increase him nothing. It's for our own sakes. So Allah created us. You know, one of the statements of the ulama is he created us for us to profit from him. He profits nothing from us, right? So... It's amazing that Allah gives us life, He enables us, He guides us to obey Him and then rewards us for that obedience. It's just His generosity, right? But the opportunities are there and the best thing we can do is to make our efforts match the opportunity, right? And so we have these opportunities to worship Allah, to grow closer, to grow nearer. So much so that in the afterlife, the only the regret people will have is that they didn't do more, right? That everything in the dunya, everything in this world, is cursed and, and, and vain, except the remembrance of Allah. And there's actually one other regret that's, that's important to point out, which is the reward for those who endured hardships, right? We all have hardships in life. I, I, can, I know without, without a doubt, there are people here with immense hardships that nobody knows about maybe in this room, right? The people who have hardships and they're patient, Allah gives them a great reward on the day of judgment. Believers, when they see the reward that they got, they say, oh Allah, send us back to the dunya, send us back to life so that we can shear our skin off of our flesh with scissors, Right? And then be rewarded for being patient with that. Take us back. Give us a chance to go through torture so that we can get what they got. So these, the only thing we regret are these missed opportunities of growing near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, getting to know Him, and attaining more light. One of the things on the Day of Judgment, each of us will be given a light based on what we've done. And we will look and say, oh man, look at His light. Look, wow, look at the light he had. I wish I had a light like that, right? So this is the light that we, we, we compete for in, in, in the dunya. This is the opportunity that we have. So Yeah, but that is, that is why we were created. One, one of the reasons that we were created in the primary. Sidi Faridun, do you have anything? You... So thank you very much for helping us to like connect the dots, I mean, between, between these things. So besides, so what, what can we do in order for this reality, for this to become more real to us? So, mm -hmm. so you mentioned seeking for knowledge is part of it. Worshipping Allah more is part of it. Yes. But are there other things that to be able to 
have that reality to be able to worship Allah as if you see Him. Yes. What are the things to get that reality to really drum it into your mm -hmm. into your head? The simplest answer that I can give to that <clears throat> is to follow the footsteps of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Human perfection, right? All of the path of Ihsan. And we're going to talk about the path of Ihsan, inshallah, over the weekend. The path of Ihsan is all the attempt to resemble becoming Muhammadan. That's what it is. He, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is the map. He is the, the, the guidebook. He's the answer. He's the, he, he's, he's the, uh, the template that we're all trying to match. So any question that you have, any guidance, right? You have to go back to the Prophet and, and to emulate him, not just outwardly, but inwardly, right? I find, you know, I don't find, you know, the splitting of the moon as amazing as the character of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I mean, there are stories that you read and you just, you know, it's, it's SubhanAllah. They will, they will shake you. They will shake you and say, what kind of a heart was this? What did Allah put into this? Because, because you know, you know that that's just beyond human capacity. That's not normal. You know, there's a beautiful uh, video. If you haven't seen it, there's a man uh, his name was Yoram. I forget his last name. Okay, I'll, I'll remember it shortly. Somebody can Google it for me. Uh, he was what we now call an Islamophobe in Denmark. And he started to write a book attacking the Prophet and Islam. He, he tells this story himself. And he started to read and he, his intention setting out was to show that Islam was a false religion, etc. That was his intention. And he said, as he read, and he started to see who the Prophet ﷺ was, he said, and it's a beautiful phrase, Allah gifted him with this, uh, inspired him. He said, I was struck by the superhuman mercy and forgiveness of the Prophet ﷺ. And it's true. He identified that it wasn't, you know, the splitting of the moon or the stones talking to him or the tree stump or the all of these things are amazing right but what made the prophet sallallahu the beloved of allah right was who he was sallallahu alaihi wasallam that's why the sahaba fell in love with him the companions couldn't get enough of him right they were in awe of him that's why i mean it's amazing and we'll talk about this inshallah over the weekend but I love the story of there was um, a woman who, there was a battle in, in the early days of Islam after the migration. And she lost her husband, she lost her son, and she lost her brother in this battle. Now I want you guys to imagine this for a moment. Anybody here lost a loved one can only, has some semblance of what that is. To lose all three of them in one day. They come to her and she's standing at the edge of the battlefield. And they say, you lost, your husband has been slain. She says, I don't care. How is the messenger of Allah? They say, your son was killed. I don't, tell me, how is the messenger of Allah? They say, your brother was also killed. Is the messenger of God okay? They said, yeah, no, yes, he's okay. And she, once she said, I want to see him. I want to lay eyes on him. I just want to see that he's okay. And she said, after seeing you okay, every calamity in the world is nothing. What is that? What is that? Show me a king or a president or a leader, anybody whose followers loved like that. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Who inspires love like that? Right? I mean, honestly, I think most Muslims, and this is why it's important to be connected to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Most Muslims, if they have a beating heart, right? If I, were, I want you guys to think about this. If I told you... This is a weird thought experiment. I would, you, you could have a dream of the Prophet ﷺ tonight for half of your wealth. What, I don't care how rich you are, how poor you are, half of it. Or if I told you I would amputate a finger, but you could see the Prophet ﷺ in a dream tonight. How many of you would take that offer? I know people, they would give an arm. Right? I know, what is that? What is that? That's love. 
And that is only inspired by knowing the Prophet ﷺ. You can't love him if you don't know him. If you think he is somebody who came to give us a few rules and that's all you know about him and we're allowed to do this, I'm not, that's fine. You're missing out. You're really missing out, right? And so learn about the Prophet ﷺ. Learn to love him. Learn the beauty and, and the joy of sending salawat upon him. Right? But you have to do that through knowledge. You have to know who the Prophet ﷺ was. This is a, a, a long roundabout. Question. But that is how you get to these places. Right? You know, the, the greatest secrets are unveiled through love. Love of Allah and love of His Messenger. Right? That, those are the greatest spiritual openings are through love. And this is, a, I, he's going to get upset with me. We, he is the resident expert in this. Honestly, I have benefited immensely from him. You know, when someone's local, Right? See, he, he's come to my town. He's come to my town. And the crowds and the line for him, right? And it's the, right? But when somebody's local, you can tend to sort of take people for granted. But if you want to learn about divine love, love of the Prophet, something that ignites fire, force him up here. I'm telling you guys, you're, it's, it's just my take, right? It's, uh, that, that's what I try to do. Right? But that is the greatest way to become present and have this because that's what the Sahaba had. They were ready to give up everything. They're ready to give up their lives, their wealth. They're ready to leave their families. They're ready to migrate. What is that? Right? That's not just, oh, I'll show up to the message. What can I do? What can't I do? It was real to them. And that's how it becomes even more real. But, so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inshallah ignite our hearts with love and fill our hearts with love and knowledge that brings love and love that brings knowledge right because that's what love should do if love is just something that we is on the tongue that's not love right love is something that makes the difficult become easy it makes hard work light work right so that's that's the that's the reality i think we have time for another question and then probably wrap up <clears throat> Why did you sit down? Um, so um, you actually gave the analogy of um, you know someone seeking knowledge and of course going out and experiencing it. It's very different, um, and as opposed to you know someone who's been told. I'm kind of wondering if the same can be said about um, patience. Are, are there levels of patience and how can one attain the highest level? Um, mm -hmm. are, are there levels to it? Just like you said, you know, learning would probably increase mm -hmm. you. I'm kind of curious if there's... Yeah, that's a great question. There are levels, I would say, to all spiritual stations and all spiritual states. There are levels. And that's why... For example, you have Sayyidina Ayyub, Job, is sort of the epitome of patience. Um, and so you have, obviously there's levels to that patience. But I'll share a hadith that I think is very interesting. And again, sets this, are there levels to patience? So a couple of things before I say it. The Prophet ﷺ also helped us, again, this is why knowledge is empowering and transformative. He told us that those with the greatest Tribulation in, the, in, the, in this world is, is whom? I'm sorry? The prophets. And then who? The people closest to them. And then who? The people most like them. So this is the inverse of what's called now the prosperity gospel. The more pious you are, the easier your life becomes. No, the Prophet ﷺ is giving us a different mind frame, right? The closer you are to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? the more tribulation will be sent to you to elevate you, right? The more you will have to endure. So set that up. There's a, there's a hadith of a woman who was standing over the grave of her son that she had buried in Medina. And she was kind of wailing, very, and, and she was in a state. And the Prophet ﷺ was passing by and he told her, be patient. And she turned and she said a phrase to him, something like, what do you know about the pain that I'm feeling? What do you know of this calamity? And so the Prophet him left. Later, someone came to him, came to her and said, do you know who that was that said that to you? She said, no, I was in a state, I wasn't paying it. Said, that was the Prophet, 
sallallahu alayhi wa She came to him to apologize. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I didn't know that was you. I'm sorry. I, you know, she, she, she was explaining. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, and this is the hadith, this is the phrase, As-sabru and as-sadma al-ula. That true patience is when the calamity first strikes. Right? It's easier to collect yourself later. So there are levels. The, where you want to, the Prophet ﷺ is telling us about true patience is to be able to, be with, to withstand the calamity when it first strikes. Right? And that even if it's bitter, you accept it because it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you take that pain gracefully. That's sabr. So there are levels to it, of course. Um, there are people who the tribulations increase and no, you can't tell because their sabr is also increasing. Right? Wallahu a'lam. Okay. Jazakumullah khair. I think we'll end here. Just I'd like to try to be on time and, and wrap it up. Um, are there any final questions? I don't, I don't want to cut anybody off if they feel like you have some. I can linger around for a few minutes if there are questions. So, Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik nashadu an la ilaha la ant nastaghfirka wa natubu ilayk. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Al-Asri. Inna al-insana lafi khusr. إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم